This afternoon I've got half an hour really to talk about the micro distilling movement. Perhaps it's an area that a lot of us can't identify. Um, so what I'll <clears throat> try and do is put some meat on the bone and perhaps give you some food for thought. And what I have to say isn't necessarily gospel, it's how I see things. Um, anyway, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. <clears throat> My name is Mark Gamble and I'm MD of Union Distillers. Uh, firstly, at that point, if you think MD means Master Distiller, it actually means Managing Director. Um, <clears throat> I couldn't possibly allude to be a Master Distiller. Um, I am the distiller, but I don't think I am. And that, that in itself is a, is a, a debate, I think, because uh, I've met one or two craft distillers who introduce themselves as gin distillers as Master Distillers. And I'm thinking, I asked them, well, what's a master distiller? So is it, have you got a qualification? Uh, you know, what is it? The best answer I had was somebody who remained nameless. He said, I became a master distiller when I employed another distiller to tell what to do. <laughs> and, you know, and, you know, I thought that probably typified it. But I'm sure uh, in the true sense of it, people like Desmond are master distillers because they've done many, many years in the industry and they've probably been involved with whiskies, and they've probably been involved in uh, distilling fermented uh, alcohols, which is, a, I tell you, is a totally different ball game to making gin. So if any of you out there are thinking of uh, uh, starting your own little distillery and thinking that you might like to do what the Americans do, go from grain to glass, if that's what they call it, um, you might need to think again to start with because it's not straightforward. Personally, it's something that I would <clears throat> like to do, um, only purely out of interest. But uh, for gin production, it's an unnecessary uh, thing to do. Um, we can buy really good alcohols in and make a really good gin from that. <coughs> Having said that, uh, fermenting alcohol and distilling it is a pretty dirty thing to do in your distillery. So probably best left. Right, sorry. Um, I'm often asked uh, why I wanted to start up a gin distillery. Uh, I think that might be something to do with my age, actually, because I could hardly say it's a, a, a career that I want to go down because I've already had a career. Um, but for those of you who are students, um, no doubt you'd answer that by saying, well, I do want to make it a career. And actually, I do think uh, the craft micro distilling movement is definitely a career if anybody's thinking of going into it. Um, it's a really good question anyway, why does one really want to do anything? Often people do things uh, not because they want to, it's often because they have to. Now I wasn't in that situation because I didn't have to set up a distillery. Um, I did it because I have a very keen interest in gin. I wanted to build a successful brand, a gin to be proud of, and not least, make some money out of it. Um, you see, gin has actually been my spirit of choice for 40 years. Uh, I've often said if I had to have a last drink, God forbid, it would be a really good gin and tonic. Um, and when I say a really good gin and tonic, I actually mean a, re a really good gin and tonic in my favourite glass. You know, that's the big glass that you always use when you get home. It's the one that you can pour the gin bottle without having to look when to stop because you know you've done it every night and it stops exactly in the right place. You know that when you empty two cans of tonic into it, because I do use two cans, that it comes to the top and when I chuck two, two lots of ice in it, it's spot on. And it, it is one very big gin and tonic. But that's what I enjoy and it's great to come home to. So yes, I am a gin fanatic and I have been for 40 years. My introduction to distilling actually started when I was away at school. We had a particularly good chemistry teacher who, looking back, was clearly interested in all aspects of alcohol. Uh, and I mean that in the nicest sort of way. He went into great depths how to make fermented alcohol. He explained that it could be made from all sorts of different things, uh, which in itself is intriguing. Um, he also showed us how to produce high-strength alcohol from this by distill it, distilling it 
in the in in the distillery that well, the small distillery had in the lab, which is actually uh, a glass uh, with lots of little bits on the side of it. Um, and then, obviously, being schoolboys, we weren't really happy about the fact that it wasn't 100%. And when explained it is impossible, uh, of course, that was a challenge, wasn't it? Why can't we have 100%? Anyway, <clears throat> eventually, showed us how to do it. So we went from a distilled 96, in theory, to 100% by adding a chemical, which absorbed all the water. And it dropped out, and there we had so really, I suppose it was intriguing in those days, and it still is now. And uh, I was definitely hooked, and, and I always decided that one day, if I ever could, I'd have my own distillery. <clears throat> after, leaving, um, after leaving school, I decided to do a student apprenticeship in uh, mechanical and electrical engineering. Um, hence my enjoyment of engineering and making things. Um, and my first year... I spent with craft apprentices. Now I, I say that because actually I worked alongside the craft people. They weren't uh, necessarily people that were going to go on to university. They were going to end up being craft people. And when you look at what they got out of life, they were actually getting <clears throat> a huge amount of enjoyment using their hands, building things, and becoming knowledgeable about what they were doing. And I mention this because, actually, I think this is going some way to explaining what the craft movement is all about. In my part, uh, I never intended to end up on the shop floor. However, I was hopefully one day going to be in charge of these people. So it also gave me a <clears throat> sort of hands-on experience. So, yes, I wanted to be craft, but I realised I had to manage and again that sort of fits in with this uh, concept of craft distilling micro distilling where <clears throat> you do both you run it you work you use your hands <clears throat> it was approximately two years ago uh, when I set up a, a distillery I was in a position to do it I'd got time so I decided to do it uh, one of the things I decided to do there, and I would advise anybody to do this who's thinking of starting up, is to keep it small to start with. You need to get all your elements in place, uh, and that includes branding and, and getting it all set up so you know where you're going. Uh, until you actually get all your licenses through, of course, you technically can't make any gin. Um, however, you know, once you've got it all in place, you can start formulating your gin recipe. In my case, I decided to set up a, a little distillery in my house. Um, so I wasn't going big, and I decided to make a conscious effort to uh, run it for 12 months to see how it went. And actually, I launched uh, the, these gins that you see on, on, on there uh, on gin, World Gin Day last, last year. Um, another aspect that I wanted to to look at uh, and which I wanted to enjoy with this craft uh, uh, movement as such was to employing some or asking some of the family to get involved and there's another aspect of it um, you know involving your kids not necessarily employing them but in involving them to do aspects of it and, and giving them an interest as well was obviously another reason why I wanted to set this up uh, and in fact uh, my kids it's sort of payback time really having spent loads of money on their education over the years, I thought, well, uh, that, you know, they haven't charged me for this, so uh, payback time. My son actually uh, designed all the branding, um, which is what you can see up there, and my daughters did the PR and the marketing brief and, and the brand portfolio. Now, these are all sorts of things that have to be done the day you start up. And I'm saying this because I know there's one or two people here who are just starting or planning on starting. <clears throat> I think, as you could probably gather, I do consider that I am a true craft distiller in a micro distillery. Um, Nicholas asked me to give this presentation on micro distilling, 
And although I know I don't claim to be a, an expert, uh, having researched the subject, um, it has made me think what it means to be part of the biker and distilling movement and what the future could be for it. And I think that's pretty important. And you'll see as we go on that uh, those questions are, uh, certainly need to be explored. One other question which I suppose needs to also be explored is to try and identify what the typical profile of a craft distiller is. In other words, why would you want all the hassle of and responsibility of producing your own gin when you could get somebody else to produce it for you? And I think that's a really good question everybody ought to ask themselves when they're thinking about making a gin. You don't have to do it yourself. One could argue the smart person does exactly that, gets somebody to do it for them. Uh, that frees up time and money to concentrate on brand building and distribution. Some might say this is a dispassionate approach. Certainly I couldn't see this approach working for me or working for any other craft distiller. The production of gin from beginning to end has to be what the craft movement is all about. Right, I shall now try and work this. Right. I think the credentials of a, of a, a craft distiller is one, they need to be entrepreneurial. This actually means taking calculated risks. It means investing your money and perhaps other people's money in your own vision. It's self-belief. It's self-belief that you will be successful. And problems are always opportunities. The next thing is innovative. Innovation. This is what it is actually all about. It's about finding perhaps new ways of doing things, resulting in some original and new ideas and products. You need to be very passionate, almost to the point of obsession. Remember, there could be no better gin than the one you have created. Preferring another gin is just not an option. So we look at the actual craft movement. I don't actually know specifically when it started, but uh, the distillation of spirits goes deep into the history of that of gin. We've, we've heard about the 18th century gin acts and things, but in, in 1726 it was estimated in England that there were probably 1,500 or more illegal stills in London. Now I didn't go around them all, so I don't know how accurate that is, but that's what they say. This certainly demonstrated some sort of entrepreneurial aspect even back in those days. Uh, these gin stills were a consequence of the British government attempting to stop and control the flow of gin by introducing various acts, as we already know. And probably um, by 1760, most of the gin stills had closed down following the last act, that was in 1751, which this act encouraged a more balanced approach to gin consumption and the supply of it. It was probably the start of what I would consider a more regulated commercial gin production. But it shouldn't be overlooked that the government could now control the production, hence the tax revenue. Um, this effectively sort of set the scene for the larger producers, I feel. Uh, I actually personally find the 18th century history of gin particularly interesting, and there are plenty of books out there to read. All tend to concentrate on the social, economical uh, aspects of it all. Whereas I've, I would love to have find out more about this, about you know these small gin distilleries, what they were made of, where they got their products from, how they marketed it. You know, I'd love to know that. And there's not much written about it, actually. But one of the things that, uh, by way of interest to you all, um, <clears throat> one of the things that I did quite like, and I think it sort of typifies um, what the craft movement's all about in a way, is the is is this thing that was called Puss and Mew, and essentially one of the acts. Don't ask me which one, you know, stopped uh, the sale of gin through hawkers, and it stopped people actually going in and buying gin 
unless somebody paid a huge amount of money. So the entrepreneurs of the day thought out a way of getting around this problem and they literally put a um, figure of a cat's head, apparently, on a wall or on a door and you walked up to it and you meowed or something and the, 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 the distiller behind the other door who never came out, uh, you'd, post your, you'd say, post your money through a box, apparently, and he would then tip a, a measure of gin through a funnel it went through a pipe and through the cat's head into the glass. This apparently was the world's first vending machine. So great, gin had the world's first vending machine. I find that interesting. I also find it interesting the fact that actually what they were doing was they were actually doing some form of marketing and some sort of distribution, which are the key aspects of any uh, gin distillery if you're going to do it yourself. You've got to sell it. In fact, I was so fascinated with it, uh, I researched it to try and see what these things look like. And of course, there's not much record of them. So I actually ended up, I wish I'd brought a picture actually, I, I ended up making my own. Uh, which works very well. It's a cat, put a tail on him. He's an old cat, by the way, antique one. It's on a door. Uh, the best thing, I improved it, of course, because that's my nature. Uh, I put a little thing on and you post your pound and there's nobody behind this door. It's all automatic. There's no electrics or anything. It would have worked even in those days and out popped a pound's worth of gin through the cat's tail. Um, if you put two pounds in, you get two shots. Quite interesting because it, for those of you, the uh, drams and things like that, actually the dispensing of alcohol, the only true way of doing it is by weight because it does change its volume. So by dropping a gold coin in, and you would receive exactly the same, or half the amount, if you drop two gold coins in, and it wouldn't matter what temperature of the day was, it would be spot on. Bit of information for you there. Um, in contrast, the American st distilleries had a similar abrupt end, albeit 150 years later, with the introduction of the Prohibition in 1920. It was estimated that there were some 4,000 distilleries in 1890, and by 1933, at the end of Prohibition, it was reduced to just eight operating legally, um, which is quite interesting because, again, it removed a whole raft of distillers. Craft brewing and distillery, I believe, are intrinsically linked. Um, It was, back in the, it was back in the late 60s, 70s, we saw the start of the first UK small breweries, which later became known as microbreweries. This term originated here in the late 70s to describe the new generation of craft real ales. This was fuelled by the gradual takeover of small independent brewers of the by the national brewers. This reduced the choice of beers available uh, for most of most beers which were then delivered in kegs. Real ale was disappearing rapidly. It was suggested that the modern micro distillery movement in America was a direct consequence of this adoption by them of our own UK mark brewer, uh, brewery model from the 70s. So our own craft micro distillery roots can be traced back to the craft brewery movement in this country. However, having said that, the Americans are some 20 years ahead, I believe, of us at the moment. I'd have covered that. Ah, that, sh that should have been a graph. I'm sorry about that. Um, this is, a, this is a, a, a list of the craft gin distillers opening in the UK. Um, as you can see, 2000 a day this goes from, and we had two openings, and it was pretty flat lining for 2009, 2010, 2011, and then we started to see a jump 2012. Um, 2013, 11, and projected for this year is 15. Now, I've, uh, this information I can thank David Smith for, but he reliably informs me that the last entry there of 15 is probably conservative and he suggests it could be as high as 20 so that's a, a massive amount 
obviously one question will arise from this is, uh, is the market big enough to support um, this many micro distilleries at this particular time? So this leads to the big question. What actually defines a craft distiller in a micro distillery? I'm not sure we have a de definition of this, or at least I couldn't find one anywhere. And I know people have asked, oh, sorry, asked me uh, about that already. Um, craft distilling brings to mind the idea of small batch production made with extra care by the owners themselves. This engages with customers who like to support small local producers and the wider consumer market, the real feel-good factor. Uh, the trend has been seen through the food industry as well. Um, I think you've seen a, 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 the trend from people shopping in big supermarkets to smaller ones and so on and so forth. So small seems to be uh, what everybody's about. I think that the future of crafters drillers, they may have to be happy with just supplying their, their local area. I, you know, I think that's an area what's going to happen, what's going to happen. So some people are going to start up their own distillery and they're going to have to rely on the goodwill and the fact that they're a local distillery and that's where they'll do their business. And in fact, if you look at the uh, microbrewery, many of them, that's how they operate. Um, the American market is very much more advanced than ours. There's I looked for sig figures craft uh, industry, and they're just not there. We, I have absolutely no idea how many cases are being produced and being sold. However, I do, I do know, thanks to David again, what's happening in America. So just to give you some idea, the, the craft market over there, I've got some figures here. Um, 2013 saw all their craft spirits grow by some 30%. Now that sounds a hell of a lot, and they reckon it's going to be another 30%. Um, you know, it's still only half a percent of the of the actual market over there. Uh, they sold approximately 8,000 cases in the US, in a uh, with a volume in the in the UK distillery of uh, UK uh, spirits market of 200 million cases. Um, there are 400 craft distillers at the moment, and they're expecting 60 a year more every year. An interesting statistic here, I mean, you know, as I mentioned, we've got uh, 30 craft distilleries in the UK in seven years. Our population is fifth of that of America. So if you do a bit of calculation, We've actually got more craft distilleries per head of population than America. So uh, I don't know if that means we have too many or what. Credentials to be a craft distiller in a micro distillery. This is the big thorny question. I've looked at the American model and, and seen what they have to say about it all. And basically these are the areas for discussion. Uh, so I've put these down. Um, first of all, it needs to be independently owned. Or I think it needs to be independently owned. The product has to be physically distilled on site, has to be bottled on site. There has to be some still capacity somewhere down the line. Now that's open for discussion again. <coughs> But just looking round, the, the size of a lot of the still of the uh, micro distilleries are putting in are 450 litres. Um, in America, um, they actually have got a, a production limit. So they've actually said if you produce more than the X number of bottles, and in their case, 600,000, um, then you couldn't consider yourself a craft distiller. Um, and you also have to use a combination of traditional uh, techniques to produce quality products. Um, the still capacity I don't find too much of a problem, although I do think that probably to differentiate uh, ourselves from the, from, the, from the mega distillers who have got huge stills, I think putting a, a restriction is not a bad idea, and 450 is 
pretty good. If you want to produce more, you just buy another spell still. Um, so, moving on to the second part of, of my presentation, is probably what you'll be interested in, is my experiences in setting up a micro distillery. So I'm going to go back. Um, that's a very good picture, I'm afraid. It's off the iPad. That is my micro distillery in my house. Uh, far left hand side is a bottle wash which I made. Um, it's a stainless, they're all stainless steel tables. There's an inset sink bowl, uh, there's a, a plunger, there's a pump, and you place your bottle over the top and it blasts up alcohol to wash the bottle. Pretty inexpensive to make. Next to it is a draining unit. Again, you can't see it very well, but the bottles are sitting on there draining, and that drains back into the sink. There's a little table there which we um, fill on, and that's a filling machine. And on this table here, you'll see there's two um, tubs which have the alcohol in and the gin in. There's a stainless steel table. There's uh, gas drawn containers sort of over the, over the uh, hanging on the wall where the lids are. And just off the picture there, there's a shrink wrap. These, this is the very basics for setting up a distillery. This room now I add is only just 4 metres by 2.7 metres. So we're not talking big here. This is a micro distillery. Uh, out of order again, but uh, buzzwords, marketing buzzwords. Craft distilled. Handcrafted, artisanal, small batch, triple distilled. These are all these are all things that, uh, that keep creeping up, and that kind of does worry me a bit because you know they're 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 not defined. There's no quantitative measurement. Uh, there's nothing to stop anybody using them. And quite honestly, uh, the industry probably needs to define this. The only one that I think they would probably be able to dispute is triple distilled. I don't quite know how you triple distilled gin. Gin, perhaps somebody can tell me, but I don't know. Right, this picture's where it should have been next. Now this is the still. Uh, you probably not, you can't go and buy one like that because I made it. Um, and I made this really to get us started. <clears throat> I didn't go and spend <clears throat> 70 odd thousand pounds on a still. Uh, and actually, that still does everything that I want to do. There's a small pot still on the left-hand side. There's a, a, a what we call a rectifying column on the right-hand side. Um, the actual column goes into a, a copper uh, tank. You'll see there's a, a funnel there. You can tip uh, my experimental gin that went wrong through there and recover the alcohol. Very important. Um, and just to explain to you, for those who are thinking of uh, making your own gins, you, this is the sort of thing, if you knew how to make, you, you could do very cheaply. So you don't have to go and spend loads of money. On the, <clears throat> the pot still there, uh, is OK, it's been modified. Uh, it's got an insulation put around the bottom. It's sitting on a, an element. It's had a special electronic control that allows you to put full power on and to cut the power back most important uh, when you're distilling. And it's, it's these elements that you record uh, when you're making your gin that gives you consistency. Because w w the way I do it is, is I vary the power uh, throughout the course of the distillation and, and, and keep it the same. Um, you can play around with those to your heart's consent. It's quite good fun, actually. The, <clears throat> the vapor obviously rises up through there. There's a sort of swan neck. Um, at the top of that there, there's, a, there's a, a temperature sensor and always keeping an eye on that temperature at the top of the still there. Um, and that correlates to the, to the temperature control underneath. There's, uh, this I've joined into the rectifying column. And that rectifying column there uh, is what we call a packed column. It's not a bubble plate column, as you'll see on a lot of stills. Um, this produces, for me, if I wanted to, if I was actually putting uh, fermented alcohol in there, that would produce very, very fine, very fine neutral spirit. 
it works more on a commercial basis whereby it's a packed column and there's uh, little uh, scrubbers and things inside and as the vapour goes up it meets the condensed vapour coming back down as it does in a bubble plate but it does it throughout the whole of the column and actually you then start to get a good separation of the product. The two drawer off taps at the top there <clears throat> allow you to adjust the reflux. Um, by adjusting those you return a percentage back into the column and basically you can decide how much you draw off depending on what you're doing. <coughs> the um, other things I think you know when you buy a if you're going to buy a small still a pot still one of the things you'll soon rapidly discover is that you're going to get through an awful lot of water. The condensing units at the top which I built that's just what they call a cactus design but these have to be fed with water and um, you know I'm, and I've seen people who are actually uh, just running water out the tap through which is a complete waste so uh, it, I plug in to the wall up there and outside the house I've got a car radiator uh, I've got uh, that's wired up to the still uh, there's, there's a little temperature control there's a computer on there it's monitoring the temperatures when that um, condensing water goes above 28 30 degrees C <clears throat> when actually you'd start losing alcohol it switches on the unit outside the big fans come on it's only a car radiator with two fans chills the water down and it's recirculated so we're not using any water <clears throat> it's this sort of de design and things that is all part of being a craft distiller for me you know it's doing it yourself really and in America, this sort of thing is very, very common. Very common. I don't think many of them perhaps go out there and spend a fortune on their stills. Probably one thing to cover, which I'll cover re really quickly, is, it, it, you know, you can't just start doing that. You have to do lots of different things to become a, a distiller. Um, basically it's split between the local authority and the HMRC. The first uh, three items on there are to do with your local authority. Um, you have to apply for a premise license, so you have to identify where you want to operate from. Uh, you have to obtain a personnel license. That means that the person who's, somebody has to be nominated and they have to go through an exam, yeah, uh, and get their license. And then you have to register it as a, a food establishment because effectively that's what we are. Um, you have to apply for a rectifying license with the HMRC which is, can be a nightmare, uh, loads of anomalies there. You have to submit an excise entry list and that involves describing in detail how you're going to produce what you're doing. You have to mark up uh, your rooms, our kitchen's got a number on it and so on and so forth. Uh, everything's done. Uh, you, have to, you can then go on to get trade facility status uh, that allows you to um, not pay duty until you produce the goods. They don't give you that when you start up, by the way. Um, and, and you can apply uh, for a warehouse keep and so on. I'm conscious that I'm running out of time. So perhaps I'll take one or two questions if somebody's got any. But essentially I hope I've covered... Uh, my experiences of craft distilling, you, you've had little insight to see how, it, how it's done. It doesn't need to be huge and certainly you don't need to spend lots of money. <laughs>